Power Athlete Radio. Just a warning, this episode may make you want to return to your high school or college weight room and confront your strength coach for robbing you of the best years of your life. And that's because we have Jim Carizzi on the program. He joins us all the way from Georgia to talk about the amazing culture and program he started at Kennesaw State University. With a little funding and a lot of commitment, this football strength and conditioning coach is pioneering a brand spanking new program rivaling that of his seasoned competitors down south. Carizzi has that special quality of a coach that you can not only hear in his voice, but infer from his comments. Everything he does is for the betterment of the team and the athletes. He believes the staff is trained thoroughly to coach and not merely act as spotters or cheerleaders. He believes good movement, hard work, and smart programming can cure virtually any performance shortcomings. And he doesn't do anything unless it serves a purpose. Brilliant. Have a listen as Coach Carizzi leads you down the path of enlightenment. If you're a high school or college weight room assistant, get your hands dirty and start leading athletes by simply coaching. Because without coaching, there is no accountability. And without accountability, there is no enthusiasm for the win. This is episode 162. Our Athlete Nation, what's up? You got Luke here again. We have another bitchin' episode. Can you, I guess we can say bitchin' on the air. Fuck right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Power Athlete Radio. All right, we got Coach Jim Carizzi here from Kennesaw State, Georgia. He's uh, the head S&C coach at Kennesaw State University and uh, did so far in our, our pre-show banter. We're going to have a wild ride. Uh, I don't know. So, Jim, let's go, man. Just give them – let the people know. Unleash who you are, what you do. I, I was trolling around on your Instagram while uh, you and John were getting to know each other, and there's some, like – like, that's how training is supposed to look, man. I'm, I'm, it looks great out there. And so what are you doing? What do you do? I appreciate that. I'm glad to, have, glad to be here. Honored to be here. Um, again, my name is Jim Carizzi. I'm the director of uh, strength and conditioning for football at Kennesaw State. Um, unique situation. Football is brand new here. We've played one competitive season. I've been here since 2014. Um, originally from small town in, in Massachusetts, just south of Western Northbridge, Mass. Uh, grew up, played football, baseball. Um, I went to a small Division three school in Vermont, military school, Norwich University, where I played football and baseball again. Um, upon graduation, I worked for two years at the University of Vermont, coaching, um, personal training, getting through, paying my dues. Um, after two years there, I spent three years at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, under a great mentor, Donnell Boucher, um, as his associate director, working with football, basketball, wrestling, and kind of overseeing the department. Um, and then in 2014, I uh, got called over here to Kennesaw State to help build the program. Uh, it's, a, it's an awesome situation here. I was able to build my own weight room, um, and we were able to just start this program with 95 brand-new kits. So yeah. talking a little bit before, it was uh, – you know, it wasn't a situation where I had to come in and fix a problem or try to build off somebody else's thing. I, we just got out a bunch of 95, 95 kids who had no clue what was going to happen, and then we just tried to mold it the best way we knew how. So I'm in, I got the best job in the world. I'm sure a lot of people say that, but uh, I come to work excited every day, and we got great kids. I work for a great coach, great coaching staff. I got a great staff, great resources, and uh, I'm excited to talk about it. I mean, you're on ground zero of, uh, you know, creating the legacy at, at that school. You know what I mean? Like, 100 years from now, assuming they're still playing sports, it started with you. That's nah, legit. F- football won't be around 100 years. They will have neutered it to what looks like a uh, black uh, no, football. No, dude, but... haven't you ever seen um, uh, what's, what's Starship this? Troopers? <laughs> See? There's Ooh. evidence that football will be around. <laughs> Only good bug is a dead bug. Uh, <laughs> Coach, I'm, I'm actually pretty fascinated by the fact that uh, you know, Kennesaw State didn't have a football team. What was really the driving motivation to start football? I mean, was there football there at one point? It went away. Like, how does that conversation being like, you know, we need a football team and we're going to get funding and we're going to go in this direction? Yeah, so um, Georgia is obviously football crazy. Um, the Southeast, being from the Northeast, I, you hear the rumors about the South football and you don't really understand it until you get here. Um, but um, Kennesaw State's only 50 years old. It's not one of the older um, – tenured universities and it started as a typing school for women um when it started it gradually has grown you know from a night type school to a junior college from a junior college to a college from a college to a university um it was naia for a while it was division two for a while but no football um it's a largely commuter school not a big campus feel um but it's just grown because we're just outside of atlanta 
and there's just such a call. The, the, the population around Atlanta is, is exploding. So for the past 10, 15 years, there's been rumors. Are we going to start football? Are we going to be D2? Are we going to do this? In 2007, they jumped to, two, to Division One mid-major. They, they competed in the, uh, the Atlantic Sun. And that was when the conversation really heated up. Are we going to start football? We're in Georgia. We got to have football. Come on, we're in Cobb County. We're outside of Metro Atlanta. Like, there's some talent down here. And there's no reason why we can't get some good homegrown talent and be competitive. Um, Vince Dooley, the legendary football coach at the University of Georgia, was was brought along to help, you know, start, like, the, the vision. And, you know, in, like, 2012 or 13, they decided just to go with it. Um, and they, we have a great athletic director, Vaughn Williams, who was brought along to really help start this thing. And he was actually uniquely a part of UConn's, UConn football coming out of FCS, moving into FBS. And if you remember UConn, 2010, they won the Big East and played in a bowl game, like a, a BCS game. So he had this vision for what you need to do to build a program. So he was a perfect hire. Um, and he said, we're not going to do anything if we can't do it right. If we, don't, if we can't raise enough money to get a good coach, we're not doing football. If we can't raise enough money to get the right facilities, we're, you know, we're not going to do it until we can do it right. And so, you know, they, they – started to pour out into the community and, and see what kind of interest there was and tons, tons of interest. So they, they, they raised the money. They, they got the resources and we got a, a, an incredible head coach and, and coach Brian Bohannon, who's a Georgia boy um, who coached at Georgia Southern and Navy under Paul Johnson. who's a triple option guy. And um, once we got the right guy on board and the, the resources were there, they just started to build and build and build and build. And, and there it was kind of long winded, but that, that's the evolution of how football got here. Um, and it's exciting. You know, first season, we sold out every game. Not a big oh, stadium. 8,500 fans packed in there. Great student section, great band. And the community just really, really ra- rallied around it. And I heard from a lot of people that have been here their whole life that they've never felt Kennesaw so alive on a weekend. Because as a commuter school, people go home on a weekends. Right. Right? Well, Saturday gives people reason to stay. And so it, it, it's been a very, very positive thing for the community. Could you talk to us a little bit about the FCS level? I mean, not a lot of play unless Appalachian State beats Michigan. So not a lot of people understand kind of that level. Could you talk to us about the difference between that and Division One? Sure. Well, um, you know, once you kind of get around it, you realize how good it is. You know, we're, you know, fully funded, 64 scholarships. Um, and we're recruiting, like, we're trying to pull people out of the next level. You know, we know that we're getting good recruits when people turn down Mac schools to come to us if we get that. I'm not saying it does. Um, but, you know, we get, you know, there's, there's a little bit less money. There's, there's, the stadiums are a little smaller. And the athletes have one fatal flaw. We, you know, what is it? Are they too small? Are they too slow? Um, whatever it is, is one fatal flaw that's holding them back from playing at the highest, highest level of football. But, you know, it's 20 hours a week full commitment, full accountability, full everything. So, no, we don't have monster facilities. No, we don't sell eighty to 100,000 seats. Um, no, we don't get five-star recruits. But the athletes you get are a lot better than you'd think. We forget just how many great athletes there are in this country and how much people love football and are willing to commit to the sport of football. And so we're getting kids in here that I'm like, damn, you guys are like – you ripped up, you rocked up, you're fat, but you, it's one fatal flaw, man. One fatal flaw is the only reason you're not playing in front of 80,000, you know? But the kids love it. They buy into it, and it's we take it as seriously as anybody. We don't, we don't, allow, any, we don't allow anything to slip. We try to treat ourselves like we're the big time. And personally, you know, I'm the son of a coach who's the son of a coach, and I don't – they're from Massachusetts where you get paid like 1200 bucks a year on top of your teaching stipend to coach. So I coach for the kids. So I like the idea of a kid who's just one level away that everything that he's doing here is going to help him become a better young man for the rest of his life. Mm-hmm. And well, odds are you going to get these guys for four years. Correct. Four this years. is not a, this is not a Kentucky basketball one and done. Yeah. You know, I've got these kids four or five years of long-term athletic development, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, we have an, we have an opportunity to put our hands on these kids and really help them become better people. And that's my calling in my opinion. 
That's great, man. So, Tex, how did you? How do we come across Jim? Uh, Zach Evanesh. Okay. Definitely recommended. Uh, and he connected us through email. Uh, we were actually at Summer Strong together, James. We didn't get yeah. a chance to meet. I was all over the place, as, as you can imagine, listening to some great speakers and motivators. Uh, but Zach connected us, and we were able to kind of connect on a coaching level. So we're D3 All-Stars. Yeah, you know it. All-America, as far as you're concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so Glory just, days. Yeah, but able to connect on that that passion as a coach. And uh, we, we talked a little bit on the phone, and we're able to set this up. So excited to get you on. And then uh, we got a boatload to talk about in terms of philosophy and the opportunity to create a culture from ground zero. So let, let's shift gears. The culture we just had Ron McKeefery on, so he was uh, kind of a big on that. Yeah. So what do you tell your guys day one? 65 guys walking in, and you are it. Well, I, oh, but first, um, those 65 guys, I mean, obviously you you uh, didn't just go out and could get 65 scholarships. Did you guys oh, – sorry to jump in. Did you guys uh, recruit from JC? Did you get transfers? Like, where did those 65 scholarships come from day one? Um, well, our first year we played with, I think, like 36 scholarships because you've got to build it over the course of a couple of years. You don't bring them all in, one and done. But this program is largely built on high schoolers. So we're not going to be a program that's trying to always go grab transfers or JUCOs. But um, the year one, we practiced and trained. We didn't compete our first year of having football, right? We just we, shit, we practiced three days a week and lifted two days a week for an entire football season. But um, that was all high school kids, all high school guys. And then in the winter of that first year, we brought in – four JUCO kids the summer we brought in like three transfers and two JUCO kids just to get 10 guys who have played some level of college football before so we weren't going out there with 27 scholarship 19 year olds who have never played football you know we did we were lucky enough to get some great 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 transfer kids you hear some horror stories about kids coming from big programs coming down to FCS and thinking they're too good for it JUCO kids who just won't listen we had none of it I mean we got Great kids who were just grateful for the opportunity to get a scholarship to play football. So that was a piece of it, but that was not our backbone. Our backbone was in that first class. But you know, when they come in that first day, you know, the, the standard has to be set. I believe in overcommunication. That really you can't you can't overcommunicate. Um, I believe very very much in knowing your philosophy and knowing your mission and communicating that mission to your people. So we really took our time and told them what our standards are for urgency, what our standard is for body language, what our standard is for lifting. And then if you don't like to do that, get out. So we weren't disciplining without instructing, if that makes sense. They had already heard what we were going to hold them accountable for. So that means when we held them accountable, you know, it was the second time they were here and they could at least accept it a little bit more. So, you know, we told them that and I said, listen, music's going to be loud. Guns are going to be blazing. All of a sudden it's going to stop. You're going to listen, learn. Then we're going to go out and do it again. Okay, and that's going to stop, listen, learn, go out, do it again. So and we, we took a really, you know, ground zero approach from a technical aspect. No barbells for the first week, kettlebells, dumbbells, learning movement skills, learning body positions, learning how we do things. Because um, we believe in movement overload. You know, you've got to be good as a mover. But what was impressive to me was a lot of our kids were coached really well in high school. Um, a lot of Georgia high schools have – pretty freaking good strength coaches. So I'm not saying the whole room was, but a lot of the room was pretty good. We were able to advance it relatively quickly, but it was still nuts and bolts, basic, 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 basic. But we explained it. We coached it. We disciplined it. That was how we were going to be. Nice. Uh, Tex, any follow-up on that? Uh, I want to get into kind of coaches development, but let's stick with athletes for right now. Uh, just checking out some of your Instagram. Uh, you, and then you said you got sand training this morning. Uh, what are some – tools that you use that are at your disposal to to kind of build camaraderie so not okay. necessarily athleticism camaraderie amongst the team so number one you know from an athleticism standpoint we believe and I, i'm stealing this line from brett bartholomew we do the simple things savagely well right we don't do anything cute there's nothing cute about what we do the stuff that seems creative is born out of some type of necessity okay um so from a camaraderie standpoint, we just feel like we have a well-communicated mission and every kid is held accountable to the same thing, which means everybody's on board, everybody's rowing the boat in the same direction. And when the energy is high, the accountability is high and things start going well, that's exciting to be a part of. 
You know, that's exciting that I'm, I am sacrificing a piece of my comfort. You're sacrificing a piece of your comfort and we're doing this together in order to achieve a common goal. That's awesome. That's team. That's why we coach. That's why we play. You know, we don't want selfish kids who are in this to try to get an accolade. We want guys who want to sacrifice a piece of themselves, put themselves outside their comfort zone together, row the boat in the same direction and see what we can't create. If that makes sense. And that's where the enthusiasm comes in. Um, the enthusiasm comes in just from a high level of accountability, a high level of, of enthusiasm, energy, attitude, toughness, put that together. And, and you're going to get a lot of guys who believe in each other and bond. Um, well, coach, I, I'm, I can tell you're obviously leading from the front on this uh, enthusiastic m- gestures on the, on the camera. And you're just raspy and hoarse. Like you've been screaming for, I don't know, two years. <laughs> or I've been smoking cigarettes for 60 years. One of the two. Can it be both? <laughs> no, it's not. I promise. <laughs> Oh, no, that's great. So, I mean, I feel like in, a, in an environment like that, too, the, the accountability measure, it, come, it, it becomes mutual just amongst the players, right? So, very rarely, uh, it's not, I mean, do you have to step in and, and slap a wrist or get somebody in line? Or they're basically like the weight room champions and weight room captains who are like, hey, get your head out of your ass. Well, this is, this is a very interesting topic that's unique to us. So, I worked for a great guy at the Citadel, and he had been there for a number of years, and the culture there was phenomenal. The weight room culture was great. Very rarely did you have to put your foot up someone's ass because the kids kind of knew what the expectation was. But when we got here at the beginning, the kids didn't know shit. Right. So what I was used to coaching was guys who had a pretty good clue. And the younger guys, you coached them up, and then they kind of followed the model. There was no model to follow. It was exhausting because you had to coach not only the big movements, but you also had to coach the accessory movements that were being paired with it. So we're doing, you know, front squat paired with a hip flexor stretch. Nobody knew how we were going to expect it to do the the front squat and nobody knew how to do a hip flexor stretch. So we had to have coaches coaching absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. So that was really unique and that was really challenging. And year one, it was, we kept everything super simple. And yeah, we had some guys who were able to do really well, but no, we were not able to put together 60 to 90 minutes straight without me just being like, are you fucking kidding me? Can you, <laughs> you know, but I tried to be patient with them. And I was. I just, just to give you a little insight, uh, you know, we, we travel around for a seminar and every weekend we have like 20 to 40 people that are, you know, uh, they're much further along in their training journey. You know, so they're less coachable, really. And, like, we battle that shit every weekend trying to get people to understand the quality of movement. Like you said, movement overload, right? But sorry to cut you off. Keep keep going down that vein. And it's just so our listeners can kind of stop listening to us talk about it and maybe somebody else talk. So what – what became positive is, and I've talked to you guys briefly before this, is I try to bring a big staff in. So, number one, I'm lucky enough to have two graduate assistants with me at all times. But I also bring in five to ten interns every semester. And because there was so much that needed to be coached, they got used to being coached. So, and this is what I tell my staff all the time, ABC, 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 always be coaching, right? And the more that our guys are coached, the more they take coaching. So it really became a very positive thing that outside of me and the GAs that were here at the beginning, it didn't matter who was delivering the message. If it wasn't a teammate and it was a coach, they took coaching, said, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and did, they did it because they knew it was coming from me, right? So that being able to, to be, because we had to coach so much, it was exhausting, it was frustrating, but it was so rewarding so empowering and so the, the long-term productivity that was a result of it was super positive. Right. I mean, now our guys, they just take coaching. They don't take offense to it because if you don't coach all the time and all of a sudden you show up and you coach a kid, they're like, where the fuck have you been? Yeah. Right. You know, but if, if that guy's getting two or three coaching cues every session, at least individualized, then they know what it's like to be coached. Mm-hmm. And they're never going to take offense to it because they know that 
in, at Kennesaw State in the weight room, your ass gets coached. Yeah. Does your ass get coached from a technique standpoint? Does it get coached from an urgency standpoint? Does it get coached from an accountability of what you're wearing, how you're walking, how you're talking, how you're running from station to station? Um, whatever it is, you're used to it. And because you're used to it, you take it. Mm-hmm. And you get five pounds and you move on. And that's really positive for, for where we are right now because even our guys who are rising juniors, like – They've been coached so much that they love watching the young guys get coached. Yeah, right, right. They love them watching some young kids do up downs. They love it, you know. Um, but that, that's something that, that was a result of, of being able to be so new. Yeah, and this that will help carry over to the field, and they'll be able to listen to what their sport coaches want, and it'll be coachable. They'll take that direction and apply it. Sure, and if, if you know, relationships, the foundation of a good relationship is trust. You can't have trust without communication. If you're not communicating, you know, consistently – and then how are you going to build that trust? And once a guy trusts you, yeah. Yeah, you're saying. Yeah. You know, cooking with gas. Things are good now. And, you know, Coach, I'm going to give you a segue here. Text. <laughs> one thing uh, One thing you talked about, like just the ABC, always be coaching, you know, and it, for the you have these interns and your coaches, and what a lot of people don't understand, uh, coaches that are listening to the show, is like if you put yourself in that scenario and you are, you are, you are just bum- like – constantly observing and like coaching, even maybe not saying anything, but preparing to say something, it increases something that I, I just generally call your coaching bandwidth. And sure. like, you, you know, just as you stress an athlete to progress, your coaching ability becomes so refined where, you know, you can handle six things at once if you are in just engrossing yourself in the coaching practice, right? And I know Tex wants to get into coaches uh, development, but I'll let you just kind of, I don't know, brain dump on, on that point. Well, I think, you know, the more you coach, the more you're going to coach. And obviously the more they're going to receive it, as I said, you know, but, you know, when you get around a master coach like a Joe Ken or a Ron McKeefrey, you know, our guy who's been doing it for a long time, you can like feel their expertise Mm -hmm. and they go and they say stuff with a, with a urgency and a purpose and a rhythm that you're like, damn, they're good. You know, you ever listen to like just somebody who's just so knowledgeable has done it for so long that that you just want to be able to sound like them well they sound like that because they've been coaching their ass off for 15 years right you know the you know the the, the 10,000 hour rule you know what is it um two hours a day six days a week or seven days a week for 10 years that's how you get to sound like a joe ken on the floor if you never get a chance to talk to him shit it's great right so the more you coach, the better you're going to get at coaching. And, yes, you can handle this guy is not a squatter. He's coming asking you this question. This guy is not a squatter, but he's got a different issue. This guy is a squatter. He's got a question. Four guys, stop. Yes, this, this, this. Yes, this, this, this. Yes, that, that, that. Yes, this, this, this and that. And you can just roll off of it. And the more fluent you are with that, the more confident you sound, the more command you've got in your voice and the confidence you've got, then they're going to be like, yes, sir, I got you. Yep. They're just going to go and do it. Yeah, that, and that takes reps. What we do have a saying for that is is we want cues, not conversations. So you sure. can pinpoint one, two, three, fire it off to that guy, and then on to the next. Yep. And I think very few people that don't have kind of college football weight room experience understand that. Uh, so it's I don't know if you, you guys said you don't have to adhere to the Saban rule, which is five coaches that are active. Everybody else just has to spot and keep their mouth shut. So in a five – coach environment with a hundred athletes you got to be on 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 uh so you, you better said, be able to see everything yeah and you said you don't have to adhere to that so i know that's a little bit different at the fcs level so those interns how many interns you said you have right now i have nine nine plus uh, I, have, I, I have a guy who has just made a full-time assistant he's been a graduate assistant with me then i have Right now, I've got two GAs. One came in early, and another is just about to leave. So full-time assistant, full graduate assistant, and nine interns. Yeah, and the beauty of that is those guys get the opportunity to coach. So anybody listening out there, if you want kind of coaching reps at a high level, hit up our boy here. But you still- uh, Yeah, so I'd love to get, kind of get into your coach's development approach. So nine interns is a lot. So sure. do you have a system in place that allows for kind of side continued education? Absolutely. And they get the reps. So talk us through that. So I, I, I try to pour a lot into my interns for a number of reasons. Number one, I, I, only, I only train one sport. So as busy as I am, I do have time in my day to pour into the, the intern. And I can't pay them anything. Some of them are in it for college credits. Some of them are in it to, for volunteer because they want to get – they want coaching experience. But if they're going to work for free monetarily, I got to pour something into them. Otherwise, they, when you invest in somebody, they're going to invest in you a lot more. 
And ultimately, I want to have a super high standard in my weight room. I want a product that looks the way I envision it, which, you know, we always strive for perfection, perfection unattainable, but the pursuit of perfection is, is like a very admirable goal. Um, but I can't do that myself. I tell my staff, like, I can run this weight room by myself. Kids will be disciplined. Kids will be organized. But they ain't going to lift as well as if they got a coach on their rack coaching them up, period. I can say it all I want, but I know that I can't see all 15 racks squatting at one time. I can't coach them all. I can keep them on the clock. I can make sure that they're not skipping stuff. I can see what I can see. But I know that I needed an army out there to be able to enforce the standard that I wanted to enforce both in the field and more, excuse me, in the weight room and more importantly on the field when it comes to the effort, attitude, and toughness it comes to run a triple option offense. And to get into that mindset, you need a lot of coaches to make sure you're really putting it out there, not missing lines, finishing through, all this stuff. Um, and so if I want that standard, I need a lot of coaches, right? And if I want coaches who are inexperienced to do a good job in those coaching environments, I need to provide them with knowledge. So mm-hmm. by me pouring into them, they are going to pour it into the kids and it's about the kids, right? Um, so we do a pretty comprehensive number one, our orientation is two days long, the first day is all about our philosophy and what we stand for and why we do what we do and how we go about our business and appropriate student athlete, coach, interaction and relationship building, um, you know, professional development, how to handle social media, stuff like that. We talk about our standards and expectations. And then, then we lift and we have fun lifting because we're meat sticks, obviously. Right. Um, and then the next day we talk, we, we break down every single X and O that we can break down in our, the current program going on right? What's our Monday look like? What's our Tuesday look like? Why are we doing this? Okay. These guys are primary group. These guys are a squad alternate. These guys are our prime. This is why we're doing what we're doing. This is what we're doing. This is how we coach. These are the cues. This is how we run our speed development. This is why we're doing our speed development. Yada, yada, yada. Um, we go comprehensive through everything and, and it's their responsibility to learn all that. And then the more I pour into them and the more they start, the more they get into it, the more they understand day one, and the more they understand day one and get better at what's going on, they become better coaches. So by me telling them all that stuff, um, they ultimately apply it and they become better. When our, when the staff is better, the kids get better. Very noticeable. Yeah. Um, but I'll keep rolling with the, with the continuing ed. Um, we have a pretty comprehensive internship curriculum. Um, I'm, I'm reading from it right here. Um, Monday is, is a leadership day. We assign it on Friday. We have a private Facebook group. We post a video or an article or something. And they have to read it, watch it, write a one-page write-up. And they have to post, post that ad in the Facebook group so everybody can read it. Um, the write-up's not meant to be super invasive. It's just to prove that you read it and to stimulate some type of thought. And then Monday, we host a conversation about it. So what are some of the things we talk about with leadership? Um, Simon Sinek, start with why, when why needs to be the foundation of everything. Um, Patrick Lencioni and his five dysfunctions of the team. Um, you know, the Fred Factor. Um, different military um, organizations, leadership styles. Um, we, you know, Jay Billis, mental toughness approach. That's, I don't know if you ever read the book, Toughness by Jay Billis. It's a really good book. Um, John Wooden's Pyramid of Leadership. Um, different things that we find from different leaders in and outside the field that get you thinking outside the box, like Mindset by Carol Dweck, growth versus fixed mindset and the, and the the ability to look at obstacles as opportunities as opposed to setbacks and accepting difficult opportunities as ways to get better and that your ceiling is infinite if you choose to view it that way. Um, so it's, we, we try to show that you can become a better coach by reading things that have nothing to do with strength and conditioning. You know, reading Malcolm Gladwell, reading all of the John Gordon books, you know, the energy bus um, stuff to get them thinking outside the box and viewing their role within a kid's life as something a little bit different. Yeah, so this this is huge in terms of coaching because that is coaching. I mean, it's implied that you have to understand the sets, the reps, the periodization, everything. And I find it very interesting that you're focusing on that mental and emotional quotient for the athlete because sure. without that connection, doesn't know doesn't matter what you know. You're right. I believe, I believe coaching is, is 70% art and 30% science. And if you don't know your 30%, you've got no business being here. Um, and you better continue to try to evolve that 30%. But the 70% is human interaction and your ability to motivate, inspire, and discipline, and hold people accountable. That's, 
that's what I believe in my young career. That's what's going to allow you to separate yourself from the field. It actually sounds a lot of parenting. <laughs> I, mean, well, I can't claim anything about that. I got no little ones running around. Oh, you got no kids? Well, dude, you are totally on the right path. I mean, um, I always tell my wife, there's people dumber than us that have actually raised, you know, Nobel laureates, world leaders, and mm-hmm. very successful people. So it just means to show that if, uh, you know, you provide, you know, good leadership, good example, and you actually um, discipline people, uh, we've come to the realization, and I have three little kids, and this was true with anything. If you can teach people right from wrong early on, it's less of a fight down the road. Like, and you know, people ask, like, why are you hard on my kids? I'm like, I'm actually harder on them now, so I don't have to be hard on them when they're 14 or 15. Like, my four-year-old daughter knows, you know, this is what we do in the morning, and, you know, like, my, my daughter's do gymnastics, and I was telling the guys, uh, they can do 10 push-ups. So they have to demonstrate 10 push-ups, a squat, and all these kind of little, like, what I call basic skills every morning before they go to school. And awesome. he's like, uh, you know, why? I'm like, so that when they're 14 or 15 years old, we don't have to have this conversation. Sure. So it's just been so ingrained. And it sounds yeah, it's called lot. brainwashing. <laughs> I'm good with that. Well, I'm, not against it. Well, I'm, I'm commending you. <laughs> I, I lie like uh, people. Are like my mom gets mad at me. She's like, "You blatantly lie to your kids." So I'm like, "Yes, 100." percent They know. <laughs> they know that they're, and it's hilarious. Like we'll go through. Like we were somewhere, and uh, these kids were eating stuff, and my daughter was like, "Well, we can't have that. It's poisonous." And I was like, "Yes, those Cheetos will kill you. You can stay away from those." Things. So, like, <laughs> like my daughters are hilarious, and they, you know, they know that like. Uh, at their plate, I'm like, okay, um, like they have to, like part of our deal too, and I, I have a, a friend who's a Harvard grad and he made a point, so, you know, there was a study years ago that said that families that at least consume four dinners a week together uh, have like, I think it was like a 0.001% chance of their kids being fucked up. Like everybody that did it in the study, their kids actually went to college and were normal. And so uh, part of our deal is like, so I, I, you know, and these guys know as soon as it's dinner time, I cut out because I have to go home and I cook uh, and my daughters like have to help. And we kind of go through this whole deal and yeah, set the table. You know, yeah, they, they set the table. They have to like, if we're cooking, they have to bring the food over and they have to love it. That lapkins. Yeah. It's great. When I'm over there, it's like, bring Mr. Lucas plate. I'm like, yeah, bring me my plate. Yeah. And they're like, oh, you like <laughs> but that's part of the deal. Like they know that like food just doesn't come from a fucking package. It like actually dad makes it and they have to help and they have to do certain things. And um, this dad I know told me this. He goes, yeah, he goes, you have to eat dinner with your kids. And more importantly, it's just not mom opening a, a, a box that, you know, some guy delivers to the door. They have to actually see the food preparation. But like listening to all the stuff you're talking about, it's really the same with coaching. Like you brought in a bunch of young athletes and you taught them right from wrong. This is how we do things. This is the culture that we're going to establish early on. And you had to fight all those things. And you talked about beating your head into the wall and you knew that you had to take that fight early. So four years down the road, you didn't have to go and teach somebody culture. Right. And I think that's where so many people fuck up. Like, you know, we, we uh, were clicking around on your Instagram page and just the videos you're pushing out. There's one universal truth to every video we've seen. People are fucking working their hard asses off. Like we're watching these guys do, you know, towel, uh, you know, the sports. partner towel. Tell, tell so, I mean, these guys are battling against each other and like seeing this culture. I mean, it, it, it makes me want to jump into these groups. So it's, uh, it's fucking good, man. I, I, I think you understand it. And I think people would do a lot better if they actually took that approach earlier on, like fight the big fights early. So they, so you could win the war and you don't have to fight all these fights later. That's, that's the objective, but I'm um, going on with that curriculum. So that's Monday is the leadership. And then Tuesday we have a Ted talk Tuesday. Um, I don't know how much you guys watch Ted talks, but, um, I've got a curriculum, you know, a 17 week, once a week. Um, and, it, and it ranges all kinds of things. The great one, Amy Cuddy about body language and Simon Sinek, start with why. Um, uh, John Wooden, before he passed, gave a great one about his pyramid of leadership. Um, General Stanley McChrystal has written some great books and some great talks. Um, and, it, you know, if you're interested, I'll shoot you the PDF. I got a, a, a little picture made. And you can post it so all your the people listening can can check them out. It's oh, that'd be great. Yeah, hell yeah. Awesome. So yeah, just remind me to send it to you. But you know, there's the, there's educational ones. There's Joe Ehrman is a, a great he, he uh, coaches football in Baltimore and has this whole big inside out coaching approach. Um, so we do do some different stuff with that. It's Tuesday, um, Wednesday they have to present on some type of a chapter from a book that they're reading that they borrow from me, um, and they also do some platform coaching work because. You know, I do most of the talking in front of the whole team, but I know that they need to get better at that if they're going to ever run themselves. So we, we get them on the platform. They have to explain 
as if we were all the team, how to, how would you do a clean? How would you do a squat? How would you do a bench? Get trade for the CSCCA tournament uh, comp, um, certification. Thursdays is Doc Talk. Thursday is uh, Programming 101. So we'll go over linear versus conjugate periodization. We'll go over relative intensity scales. We'll go over um, the tier system. We'll go over APRE. We'll go over 531, um, the juggernaut method, different styles that are out there. We talk about how to use different tools out there and apply it to whatever situation you might be in. And then they're going to have to write a program. And then somewhere in there, we'll start teaching them how to use Microsoft Excel in a way that um, coaches need to use it to be efficient when you're writing programs for 100 guys. Or if you're running a department and you've got 500 athletes, you can't handwrite them, you know, mm-hmm. if you want to put percentages and stuff. Um, and then uh, F, uh, Friday is, is called Friendship and Unity Friday. Fuck you, Friday. <laughs> and we do, some of, we do some type of fun physical challenge and then we go eat at Cracker Barrel. <laughs> nice. Right. Because well, we have beards and we're men and we have fun, even though we do have one female. Sorry. Yeah, but, well, uh, Cracker Barrel. You need, you need that one chick in there who's tough as nails, right? Or Waffle House or Cracker Barrel, one of the two. Uh, oh, Waffle two House things. is it? Well, I, uh, I, I used to live in Tampa, Florida when I played for Philly and I used to drive back from uh, Tampa to Philly and I used to only stop at Waffle Houses. And I got to the point where I would only stop and get a coffee. And then I got to the point where I would just not fucking eat. Because, like, that Waffle House coffee will fuck your stomach up. Oh, it does. Every Tuesday. Sunday when I go. <laughs> you sit there. And, like, when the, the lady. Well, well, like, so, so, like, you got your cup and you drink it. And the lady comes over. As soon as you, like, put it down, you're like, just, I just put my hand over it. I'm like, we're, we're absolutely fine. We're fine. We're fine. Yeah. You know what? Like, they, they I like, want more coffee. No, one, time, no, uh, one time I took a sip and I put my hand over it and she poured the hot coffee on my hand, not yeah. even realizing that I put my hand over it. And I looked at her, I was like, oh, it's, <laughs> you're fucking weak, fucking water. Oh, that's, that's brutal. So then how, how long does the, the internship, uh, this cycle last? Is this like uh depends. So in the fall and the spring, it's semesterly, you know, so you're a full 16 weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, typically we try to find people who are credit seeking at that time. Um, not all the time, but we, we try to. And so that's a full 16 week internship, but in the summer it's more like nine because they get here right before we start training. We got eight weeks of training. Um, and then they leave before football camp starts because the fall interns will start, um, when football camp starts in August. Nice. So it changes a little bit based on the time of year that you intern. So one thing we always say is you fall to the margin of your experience. So it sounds like you have built a very comprehensive coaches development experience for your, your interns. So I'm curious where this came from. Were you exercise science major? Uh, did Bohannon run this kind of thing? Did you stumble upon him? Did you seek him out? So, where did um, these tools come from? Well, my mentor at the Citadel was big on education. Um, he put, put a lot of professional development projects on us and I found so much value in them that I just got obsessed with reading like, books that make you think differently and uh and just continuously stepping outside the box and learning as much as I could um and then I came out here and I realized well I don't have I'm not going to have the staff of knowledgeable people that I want that I need so I better find a way to put something together so they can go out and do a good job and not just be bump on a log that are here to clean the floor because if you have interns and all they do is clean I mean are they really are they really going to work for you I don't think so, you know, so. They're going to learn what not to do in the weight room because those coaches aren't doing them right. Yeah, but, I mean, don't you think, like, most coaches um, are, you know, get to this idea that, you know, they're too busy. I, fuck, I mean, I took my recruiting trip, and I remember I went to Nebraska and got to sit in Boyd Epley's office, and he literally, like, pulled up all these screens and could look at all this and had all these matrix and like about 20 minutes into it, I realized he'd probably never been on, or he hadn't been on the actual coaching floor working with players huh. in <laughs> years. Because he was talking about these people, and I was, you know, like, hey, you know, this guy and these numbers and this, and, you know, this guy's with this group, and I can watch here. And I realized he was just sitting in his office, like in his ivory tower, you know, just up there thinking he was, you know, fucking master blasting this thing. Well, well, I'll tell you this, what, not to interrupt you, sir, but what, what I have realized is I stepped in, into this role and I'm reading Nick Saban stuff and I've watched a lot of his interviews and the idea of I coach to coaches, coaches, coach to players, um, there's more to that 
than I used to realize. I used to think the same thing. You, you'd hear stories about coaches coaching from a megaphone in the office. And I don't think that's okay. I don't think that's okay. But my responsibility is to create the plan, communicate the plan to my sergeants and lieutenants, my staff, right. you know, and they're going to go out and really execute it. And my job is to drive culture on the floor. Um, now I speak to them and I'm always on the floor. I'm never sitting in my office during a lift, but I do like to give a little bit more credit than I used to to coaches who might not be doing as much actual technique based coaching, because if my job is to create a culture I can't do that and teach a kid how to do a clean at the same time. That's something that I really, and that's why I hire so many interns. I hire so many interns and I try to get as many staffing in here because if I want them to look a certain way, technically I come up with the plan, communicate it to my staff. They go and execute it. I'm the one as the voice out loud. And when I don't like what I see, I stop it, re-communicate the message, see it, do, see it done better or stop it fill in expletive here and then expect it to be done. <laughs> expletive, expletive, uh, comma. Ass- assuming that your sergeants and lieutenants and people are capable enough to be able to convey your message. I mean, I think that's really where a lot of people run into issues is, you know, like how capable are people, how good are your interns, how much work have you put in? And it sounds like for what you're doing, you've created a comprehensive program that helps develop these people. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, a lot of coaches just magically hope that you know how to fucking do this right. stuff. Well, yeah, I, don't, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair. Well, I mean, 18, 18, 19, 20-year-old kids who just like to lift weights, you know, or they just got done playing. Like, they don't know how to coach. If we don't teach them to coach, then they're not going to be able to do that. That would be worth a damn. Well, you know, I mean, I, think about how many – I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this. I mean, think about how many coaches I've encountered that realistically don't know how to teach a basic lift. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I do. I, I remember numerous times, you know, going in and watching somebody teach something and being like – fuck, I don't think these guys know how to teach this. I mean, that's why in the NFL they use so many fucking – I mean, that's why the hammer strength is so big. And the yeah. hammer strength is just sit down and go till failure. You know, I mean, you ask a kid to do, you know, hey, let's squat heavy to failure, you better, one, have the kid rope efficient, and two, have some spots and know what the fuck you're doing and having done it before. How many right. coaches can say, hey, man, I've been under 405 and I've squatted it to failure. I mean, it's just kind of that lost art. And, um, you know, part of our deal especially is we lead from the front, like – I'm never going to ask somebody to do something that I physically can't do. Sure. More importantly, that I haven't done it. Um, And I think that's a a huge problem we run into with a lot of coaching. People just have no practical understanding of it from that kind of personal level. They're just writing, you know, writing numbers and, hey, do this, do this. Oh, yeah, looks good. That's because that's what everybody else is doing. Ron McKeefer is doing that. Mike Boyle is doing that. You know, so I'm going to watch a YouTube video and I say I'm going to program it. Without understanding. Without understanding. You've got to try it. You, you got to try You got to put yourself out there before you can really feel comfortable coaching it. In my opinion, like it took me a year of experimenting with the APRE protocol before I was willing to do it with my players. Right. It took me and Donnell when I was at the Citadel an eight week cycle of triphasic training right directly on the book before we felt comfortable enough to program it with our kids. You got to be able to get under the bar and do it. You got to be able to, especially when you're younger. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you're a little older and you've done so much and your body starts to break, I just, for my first time, my career, I slipped the disc pretty bad. Like my right leg doesn't work right now. Um, like a real disc injury, not like my back hurts. So I'm not getting into the bar right now, but I've done it for 15 years. So I feel comfortable making kids get uncomfortable in the weight room. Mm-hmm. So talk to us about your assessments. So you get a freshman in there or you get a transfer Juco. What's your assessment protocol for all these athletes that are new to you? So our, we have great um, athletic training staff, and we FMS everybody. I would not do that with just my staff because we don't have the time, resources, equipment, or knowledge. We don't have enough people to do it. So they'll come in, they'll FMS everybody so we get an idea. We use it as a guideline to find trends. We don't say, oh, you got one on the squat, you can't squat. We don't do that. Um, but basically what we'll do is, you know, here's a here, – got to understand, I'm getting Division One kids, they're not – Weak as piss, you know. What I mean, we got some, they're not going to get hurt trying something, right? So, here's a 60 pound kettlebell holding on to your chin and do a goblet squat. Here's how you do it heels down, knees out, chest up, back straight. Here's how we do it set your belly, you know, descends, sit back, you sit in a chair, give them all the cues, and then you watch them do it. If they've clearly done it before, we'll put it down, put them in a bar, right? And we watch that. So, we'll progress and regress based on their ability to do it because I think it's cheating a kid who's been coached really well in high school for four or five years to not let that kid squat his first semester here because I'm nervous about it. Right. 
right? Now, I am irresponsible if I don't evaluate that kid yeah. and be like, oh, oh, my God, you can't do this. Let's, now, you'll be brought backwards, and you're going to gobble and squat with a mini band on your knees to make sure that you can maintain proper positioning, achieve proper depth, all these things. And if we feel like a kid is too far gone, what they're going to do is they're going to do a simpler movement with a bunch of correctives. So when we got here, we knew that we weren't going to be able to coach enough kids how to squat if they and coach the kids who knew how to squat. So if they were terrible, they hex bar deadlifted off of blocks and they did three corrective movements after, right? And we had the FMS score, you were a hip problem or you were an ankle problem. So you would hex bar deadlift, which means you're able to do that unless you're a motor moron, which our kids are not. You know, pry yourself into position, push down into the ground, squeeze your butt cheek to the top and then reverse it back down to the block. Right. Meanwhile, you got half the staff or three quarters of the, of the staff coaching the squatters who can do it. And the other guys are hex bar deadlifting with correctives until they say, coach, I think I can squat now. Okay, well, show me. If they can do it, they join the squatters. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's how we assess it. And it's a little bit more live action than some people would put people through a comprehensive plan. We kind of do it, you know, with bullets flying. But we do not let people progress until we feel like they're physically capable of doing it the way that we want to see it done. That makes sense. Yeah, and you can use the lifts themselves as a freaking assessment too. Yeah, yeah. Well, Charlie Weingrub, training equals rehab, rehab equals training. Right, right. So well, that's good stuff. So uh, one of our assessments, we kind of parallel them with performance tests. They're assessments, and then there's kind of performance assessments to see if our programming is working. Okay. There for the high stress of the field. So we want high stress tests. Uh, talk to us about some of your performance tests. Okay, so number one, we try to create the most high intensity environment possible so every day feels like a test in some capacity. I want them to feel somewhat uncomfortable every training session. But overall performance assessments, we one rep max once a year, right before they go home in the month of May because they get three weeks off in May. So we'll test them right at or before finals and we'll see where we are throughout the course of the year. And we'll do clean squat bench, vert, broad, pro shuttle, uh, 40 yard dash, and we did med ball. We did a 30 pound granny toss. We painted numbers up on our wall. You might have seen the video. Yeah, yeah, we saw that. Um, and we also did a, a 14 pound broad toss where we put a launch pad on the ground and they stood with their toes on the line and they threw the ball as far as they could. I believe in whenever you can eliminate skill from an assessment to see what is the true measure of power. Um, whenever possible, not always possible. So we'll do those once a year. But to maintain accurate numbers, we do um, a lot of our programming is based on monthly open set evals, which you'll take 85%, you hit it for five to eight. If you took 85% in, in, in September and you in, in June and you hit it for six, and you put it away in the next month, you hit it for nine, hey, guess what? You're stronger. Congratulations. And now we'll use a rep max, and we now have more accurate numbers to feed our, our – um, our percentages off of um, so <laughs> monthly evals and some capacity, one major eval once a year. Nice. And uh, the good thing I like that is immediate feedback. Sure. So you're, you're not only just telling them they're getting stronger and more powerful. These are opportunities for that to show that right. this stuff works. And then, and they work hard for another month and just can't. Yeah, who'd have thunk it? The coach knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> coach, I'm curious. I, I'm going through the Instagram. I saw that you get, you've you strapped some Tendo units up. Are you going to throw that into any of your performance tests? Well, you know, going back to the FCS versus FBS, budgets are a thing. A Tendo unit with the computer will cost about, you know, $1,300, $1,350 per unit. Mm-hmm. So we don't – that wasn't in my startup. But I got a great weight room. I mean, I got one of the nicer weight rooms you're going to come across – but I didn't have the money to outfit it with all that much, with all those tendos. So unless you guys want to raise money for me and buy me, no, we, got, we do have a solution uh, for I, you though. We, we were in the same boat. Uh, we have a tendo here and we use it. And um, we all go on. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a few thousand athletes online that we work with and travel every weekend. And we really needed a way to not only quantify speed, but you know, we're, I'm a big uh, competitor acceleration guy. Uh, sure. The only lifter that trained me was uh, buddies with, you know, Dr. Swap, Fred Hatfield, and something we talked about. And that was actually, I think, how I was able to play 10 years in the NFL was the idea of as mechanical advantage increases, I need to keep accelerating whatever it is, whether it be a bar or an individual. Yep. And so um, about a year and a half ago, we got hit up by a kid who wanted to design a collar that actually counted reps. 
And he, so he came to me and he was like, Hey, I'd like to have this collar. And I was like, yeah, that's the fucking worst idea I've ever heard. Yeah, it's got <laughs> hardware in here. It what? tells you if you got reps, how fast they're going. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa what? Whoa, wait, wait. I, and so I told him, I was like, there's a theory of compressor acceleration and more important, there's an idea of velocity and speed. And we showed yeah. it the end of it. And I said, if you could create me a collar that could do all of these things, both, you know, uh, measuring eccentric, concentric, accentuation phase, and I could start understanding bottom force and all these key factors. And it was nice and jiggy and I could mount it as a collar and have it as an app and have all this information in the phone. Uh, could you create that? And so the kid came back every month. And uh, about six months ago, we went to Kickstarter and raised a hundred grand and we're actually building these. And these wow. cars are about $195, $200. A little different uh, than the 1300 F10 units got to run. Me. Well, and what's dope about it is there's, um, it uses an accelerometer, so there's no cable. So it's not like you have this, you know, unit with the cable and this. And so we can actually use this on not only a clean, a snatch, a deadlift, a press, a bench. You can have it pretty much on any type of bar movement. You That's want. amazing. And so this thing, uh, I firmly, firmly believe, I mean, he custom designed based on everything. I remember going back and being like, shit, uh, this is giving us some really amazing, meaningful information because we can see where people are really struggling. You know, what is the bottom force? What is your ability to, you know, uh, transition between different muscle contractions, however it fits. And the other crazy part is we started seeing people were, you know, jerking the bar. I mean, it really kind of, uh, you know, led to claim for some good Olympic lifting, but fuck, I mean, the squat, the bench, seeing where acceleration was, you know, how it all kind of fit, where people were kind of hitching. So extremely valuable. And, um, this type of thing I really believe will become uh, as valuable training tool, you know, and when the guys come, you know, we meet every week and then we kind of discuss it and I try to explain it to these guys. All you have to do is you have to just create this. And then what we do is we get in enough really smart people's hands like you, and then you take a look at the information and then almost you contact me back and you said, Hey, you know what, this is how we're using the information. This is the meaningful thing we can talk. And I, I, I you know, I'm working on a, uh, a full write up on velocity based training, but yeah. at the end of the day, uh, if you create the tool and then, you know, uh, this is like everything, you know, if you create the tool, all you have to do is put it out there and then let the master craftsman come and then tell you how they're using the tool. Yeah, for sure. And I know for me, I'm trying to evolve my training and, uh, just to kind of talk about how we set our stuff up in the winter time, we did infantry armor and airborne or our three groups. Infantry was our base group, all freshmen, basic juggernaut linear periodization, right? Um, the middle of the armor group, we codenamed Beefcake. It was all about getting bigger and stronger, and it was all APRE. Um, the Mark Watts edition, I don't know if you ever watched his video. Mark Watts did an incredible deviation of the traditional Brian Mann APRE, um, and they did that, and they got after it, and we did a full triphasic cycle with our advanced guys. But I'm like, they were advanced as sophomores. You know, when you get a wideout squatting 440 as a freshman, I'm like, where, how much do I really need that kid squatting 500 as a wideout? You know, so then he tried physics for a year or two. What's he going to do as a fourth or fifth year senior? Velocity based training in my future. So I've reached out. Sornex sent me that Tendo, and it creates the best level of, of competition in a weight room as possible. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're dealing millennials, and I don't, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> oh, God. Objective feedback that they cannot argue with is the most valuable thing that you can give them. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen the, the picture of, the kid missing the line. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my picture um, that happened at Kansas State last summer, and we caught it on camera and put it out there, and, like, that's objective feedback. Don't tell me that that's not, like, going to change behavior. Right. Yeah. That, that, I in the sky don't lie, man. Like, that's the reality of it. And so when you get velocity-based training, I said, you got to move this 0.7 meters. you got to go down. If you don't move this fast, you got to go down the weight. Well, no one wants to go down in weight. You know, especially with somebody else on the rack who competing with you or talk shit to you, it doesn't have to go down. That's the best training that we're going to be able to create. So my plan is to buy four or five tender units for my advanced guys next year. Well, why don't we try to find a way to get a whole bunch of these to you at a much better price point? I would and, love uh, that. I would love it. As we, we love the guys at Sora next too. But, uh, well, well, no, uh, uh, Bert's a good friend of ours, and uh, I've been waiting to try to get this thing as dialed as possible and send – Every single available one I have, the bird to have, those guys start pushing this because I really believe that if we can, you know, uh, right now where we're at with this is the, the hardware is designed. It's right? the interface. It's the interface and constantly going back and tweaking and understanding the numbers. And what's cool is they are constantly rewriting the algorithms and, uh, you know, tweaking it daily. 
And all we need is we just need more data points. And so my deal with Bert and what I'm going to hit him up on here shortly is like, I want you to be basically take these. I want to get them as many people's in as many people's hands as possible because that's, what's going to really uh, hyper jump this thing. And, you know, we can just keep getting more and more data points. I mean, velocity based training is pretty interesting. If you take people like <laughs> it's kind of a chicken or egg thing, velocity based training makes real sense if you're strong. But yes. if somebody's not strong, velocity-based training is like a fucking hand job. It just doesn't make sense. So if you got a receiver that squats 440 and all of a sudden you bring him in, is it necessarily more important for him to squat 500 pounds or is it more important for him to move 400 at 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8 meters per second? And then next thing, pair that up with a box jump, you do your triphasic. Next thing you know, the kid's burning vert, 48 inches or some god-awful amount. 48 <laughs> uh, might be a little bit much. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm – <laughs> <laughs> in a perfect world. It's a lunar jump. Yeah. No, no, I feel you. I feel you. Well, right. a perfect example is we got a kid. He's an incoming freshman. He's training with us right now. His Bronson Rex Steiner. He's a son, he's a son of a Steiner brother, you know, which yeah. is the like coolest thing ever, right? Big Papa well, the, the kid, yeah, Big Papa Pump's his uncle. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, he kid, kid comes in, 600-pound back squat. I've seen the video. It's beautiful. 365-pound power clean. It's beautiful. Bench is 410. It's beautiful. And he's pulling three – 365 hex bar, you know, at point, 1.2 meters per second. That guy doesn't need to do APRE no. with 495 on his back for five to eight reps. You know what I'm saying? Like, he needs to move 400 pounds, one, you know, 0.85. So that's – I want to make sure that I got people – doing things that's more appropriate for their body as we continue to evolve. And the kids are going to feel like their, their program is evolving as they go through their years here. That's well, for, another thing. For me, um, you know, I, I was really obsessed early on in my college and even early in my NFL uh, career with this idea of chasing one rep maxis. And I remember all of a sudden, like my second and third year, uh, those really became not nearly as important as it used to be. And I remember my old, uh, the old power lifter that trained me was like, you know, uh, I want somebody to set a stopwatch. And I want to see how fast you can do a triple on whether it be a back squat or a bench. And so we started timing reps. Um, and it became this idea that, you know, if I could hit a certain number, and this is, you know, shit, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, um, the idea of like, hey, if I can do this, and I basically started creating this metric where if I could squat, I think it was uh, 585 for five, if I could bench uh, 465 for five, if I could do 10 pull-ups with 90 pounds between my waist, and I had all, I was like 585 for 10 on the dead, on the RDL, and I had all these different matrix. Whatever. Um, I knew that if I, the sooner I got back to those numbers, uh, I was good. And I didn't necessarily have to push because in my rookie year, I had this idea like, hey, I'm going to chase more RMs. I want to hit this. And actually, the amount of time that I had to put in and actually the extra body weight and size that I had to put on to hitting those numbers was counterproductive towards my ability to play football. And, and nobody I, cares how much you can lift. They yeah. care how you get off the ball. Well, yeah, and, and I, I don't ever remember somebody walking over and being like, damn, how much you bench? All right, I'll just fall down. Or how much do you squat? It was all how fast I could move within with, with a certain weight. And it was this – it was really a, a, a strange because, you know, I, uh, I had learned and been taught about the compensatory acceleration, you know, move the bar. And then I got romanced into this idea of numbers. And then all of a sudden I remember it. I was like, fuck, this is going to get me cut. And I had to take a step back and almost, you know, go from that absolute back to that power. And the majority of our program, I mean, it was it really actually brought a smile to my face, is really based on this idea of rep maxes. Uh, you know, for athletes, I'm not always, uh, you know, like you said, you test one RMs, but rut max has almost become more meaningful at Absolutely. a certain percentage. Like if a kid can lift 85% of his one RM or even, you know, this, and, you know, he can move, uh, you know, that five RM or those five reps, and he can move each of those reps within a certain percentage. That is so much more meaningful for football than, hey, I can squat 700 pounds. We want rep max because it's fun. It's a great training environment, and it's a time of the year you know, May, uh, April, where it's the furthest away from competition. Mm -hmm. We're out of spring ball. We do spring ball early. We're out of spring ball. And it's, a, it's the one time of year where I could slow us down on the field, really just work speed training, get ready to run the 40, and just work on getting real strong and do it one time. And I am that quick to say you're done. Sure. Or, oh, you said you don't feel good? You ain't testing today. Yeah. Sorry. That don't give a shit. You yeah, know what I mean? right. Guys get stronger. I want I want them to feel like what we're doing is working because until you're a junior or senior, you don't necessarily know that because I'm moving better, I am better, and the training's getting me that way. When you're younger, you kind of want to see those numbers. 
Yeah. You, know, you got to play that little Jedi mind trick with the kid and let them have a little bit of their fun. And I'll tell you, there's a pretty cool environment that goes on when the, when there's 65 guys in a room with one rep maxes and they're all around and hate breeds playing or flock or whoever's gone. You know, <laughs> and, and, and everyone's around you and you hit a number you never hit before. And then the place goes fucking berserk. Yeah. You know? Did he say Falco? Flocka. Oh, I, I thought you said Falco. Flocka flock. Do you even know who Falco is? Shane, Shane Falco. <laughs> Footsteps, Falco. Um, but you know, it's 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 more about the fun, you know. And I care about the the power metrics, the, the jumps. Sure. Right. That's, that's what I like. Um, it's just a pain in the ass to use that vertex every day. Yeah. No, that thing will give you eights. So we have we have six uh, just jump mats, and we'll do that periodically throughout the season just to compete, see where we're at. You know, if you're within five ten percent of your your highest jump, and you're in heavy training period. Then, then our power is in a pretty good situation. You yeah. know, you know you're not going to have all the juice because you didn't taper to it. Um, but you also want to be like, oh, you usually jump 36, but right now you just jump at 31. Well, maybe we're at a point where we need to start pulling off. Yeah. So do, you, do, you, do you ever use that stuff for accountability? Um, I, I remember we would test uh, basically a 1RM Vertec uh, before winter vacation, and then immediately we came back out from winter no. vacation. No. And, and, if, if all of a sudden we were within, like, you know, if all of a sudden you vert, let's say, 30 inches and you come back and you vert 26 and it was greater than, you know, 7 to 8% of the standard deviation, you got punished like a motherfucker because they know you didn't train. I think it's awesome. I think that idea is great. Um, but I'm going to tell you the truth. The football season, and I'm preaching the choir, the football season is so brutal that, like, I just want you to go home and get healthy. I just say, guys, come back fit enough to train. Mm-hmm. because our program is built on running. We do tempo technique teamwork, right? Those are our three T's. And we train fast, right? And you got to be fit enough. And I don't expect you to be guns blazing when you get back. I expect myself to program accordingly. So by week three, now we're guns blazing because you came in with a baseline level of fitness. But, you know, I can't expect it to train well when some of our kids – they, they got nothing, man. They can't afford a gym membership. Right. My schools don't have anything. Can't expect them to really come back in great shape. And some of them is just like, go home and get away, you know, eat some potato chips. Stay out of trouble. Just stay fit. Don't get anybody pregnant. Yeah, please. <laughs> that was our biggest one. Don't get arrested. Don't get anybody pregnant. Just say, get, don't get arrested was our number one. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, so, so I think that's great from an accountability standpoint. But um, I don't expect my kids to come back ready to go. Yeah, one thing, the message we try to tell our coaches, because a lot of the guys that we work with at our seminar, their entryway into what we'll call strength and conditioning was through the doors of, a, you know, the box, the CrossFit box. And, and it's like, hey, listen, all these coaches want when they come back, if you have like, somebody that you're lucky enough to get an off-season program going, is like, they just need to be in good enough shape to survive the training. Your job is to make better movers. Uh, you know, if you can get them faster, if you can get them more powerful, don't worry about, don't geek out well, on the conditioning. L- leave that up to the coach when they get to training. Yeah, camp. but I mean, if, if you think about it, though, it's the easiest thing to train. Yeah, get right? in shape. Well, like it, it is. I mean, it's uh, if getting strong was easy, there wouldn't be a bunch of weak motherfuckers in the world. If getting fast was easy, then you know what? There wouldn't be. I mean, we wouldn't see uh, legions of slow. Mm-hmm. Uh, the easiest thing to, and the easiest well to go to is conditioning. You know why? Because you can just fucking torch somebody. You can put together some god awful circuit, couplet, triplet, whatever you want, and you can set somebody's feet to the fire. You can torch them, and it's also the fastest adaptation. Yeah. Um, you know, I've said, dude, I can get you in the best shape of your life in about eight weeks, but I cannot get you strong in eight weeks. Yeah. Uh, like chasing strength is a lifetime pursuit. Yeah. And so I, I think like. You know, people fall to the level they're training. I mean, water finds its own level, and if if you have a limited resource available to you, what's easiest to do? Go to the conditioning bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, he you know, he's over here talking about you know APRE, triphasic. I mean, there's <laughs> unfortunately there's a lot of strength coaches out there that have no fucking idea what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. And you know, I mean, you know, Mark Watts is a good friend of ours, and I actually read all that. And uh, you know. You're talking about actually, you know, using a multi-year system, looking at different athletes at different progressions and realizing that you don't train your beginners if you train your advanced athletes. Right. And there's a, I mean, that's really how we made our bread and butter and, and based on our success, successes. Because I started talking about what I did as an NFL player isn't what you want to do as a 14, 15, or even a 19 or 20-year-old kid. What I did towards the end of my career isn't what I did at the beginning of my career. And you have to look at different 
uh, you know, faces different avenues, you know, uh, uh, you know, fucking, I don't even know what the word is, but just the really multi-year just, approach. Yeah. It's a multi-year approach. Life cycle. You, you have to be able to, yeah, the life cycle, be able to take this kid from day one and be able to mature him into a four or five year athlete, allow him to keep better, not hurt him and allow him to get better and be able to show him that he's getting better with on the field and off the field performance. But it's having the vision for that, which James is talking oh, about. Oh yeah. I mean, but he, but he has a plan. The problem yeah. is, is most people, don't have a, a you know a plan that extends no, past no, no, the no. end of this. They week. have what they did in <laughs> yeah. high school. Oh Jesus! Or I did this. If, if I got state, a, we, you know? we went to the Texas High School Coaches Association uh, conference, and we were sitting there, and all we heard from you know a bunch of really overweight guys with shaved heads and goatees and performance polos, and all they had yeah, diabetes uh, talk about is, well, this is what I did. And when the guy told me, I was like, well, what did you do? Well, when Bear Bryant, and as soon as I heard Bear Bryant, I just fucking put my hand up and walked <laughs> away. And I said, dude, if you're talking to me strength conditioning for Bear Bryant, because I played for a Bear Bryant guy who told me that water was weakness, who told me that, that, you know, if you drink water during practice or in between practices, you need to abstain from water from sunup to sundown. That's how you build toughness. And we also conditioned every little, literally it was conditioning before practice he would stop practice condition in the middle, and then we were conditioned at the end. And everything else was dog shit, because what were you doing? Trying to save yourself for the conditioning, because you knew you weren't getting any water. Like, that's the <laughs> problem. That's, like, that was my high school strength coach, who was a Bear Bryant guy. You made it to the NFL. It fucking works. <laughs> it what works. are you, out of your mind? Oh, Jesus. I fucking, we're doing it wrong. I succeeded, and, and I'll tell you this a hundred times. I succeeded in spite <laughs> of a lot of really dog, like, I, like, that's how I know NFL players aren't built. They're actually born. Like, I <laughs> succeeded in spite of a lot of shitty fucking coaching. And that's when people started asking me about this stuff. And I was like, um, yeah, I actually know what good stuff is, but I'm really going to tell you about the bad stuff that I've seen because I've seen it all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, just sitting here listening to you is actually, uh, um, uh, you know, two two things are pretty apparent. Uh, one, uh, whoever your mentors were did a wonderful job and you were, uh, extremely smart listening. And two, I don't think you're going to be at Kershaw State very long. I think uh, now I, you have no desire to go anywhere. I, I, I know, but, uh, you know, I mean, uh, with, with what you're building in that culture, uh, it won't go unnoticed. Yeah. It, it won't go unnoticed. It's, it's actually, uh, some, and we've, you know, have a lot of friends that are, you know, NFL strength coaches and college. You know and this and that. What's that? You know, those guys. Oh yeah, yeah. So so Kaz was one of my uh, uh, was our young intern when I was in Kansas City. So when Kaz, you know, we take him out to dinner and you know help him around. And so I mean, just seeing these young guys really mature. But like listening to this, it's extreme. It, it, it gives me faith again because so often do I lose faith. So it's just, <laughs> I'm glad I can reinstall faith. Oh, it's it, it's fucking dying, man. Hey, like, just, hey, just remember, there's a lot of good out there too. The bad is just glaring. There's a lot of good out there. A lot of good. Well, it seems that the bad is uh, most apparent on the internet, and it seems to be the people that are yelling the loudest. And, um, you know, like, you know, you also made another great point, something we really buy into is uh, there's a lot of different training styles. But unfortunately, if you want to understand them, you have to immerse yourself and really, you know, do them and understand them and understand the application. I mean, you're talking about, you know, uh, you know, a bunch of different types of styles and realizing that, you know, hey, we did these things. We saw where they work. We know where they fit into it. We know the application. And there's probably a lot of things you did that you're like, that sucks. We're ever going to use that. Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the one thing I didn't hear you talk about as much conjugate. I mean, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, using a trap bar deadlift because it mimics the squat. And they don't have to necessarily worry about pulling around their knees. I mean, so you're, you know, you're rotating different implements and doing different things, but you know, you're not talking about any accommodating resistance. I mean, there's just, there, there's a lot of cool things, a lot of cool truths, but yet I'm sure if some kid was ready for that, or you got to the point, you would throw that stuff in more. Yeah. We threw um, our intermediate group, it was just like straight up west side. You know, we carried on our heavy day and then six by three dynamic effort with chains. Sure. All by three rep max board press, you know. Try to find a little bit of everything, my man. A little bit of everything. Try to yeah. get them good. And, well, and you know what? And even throw some classic bodybuilding stuff. I mean, one of our programs that fucking we can't seem to keep people out of is just an old school bodybuilding program that I used to put on, you know, a version of a program that I used to put on muscle, um, you know, at certain points in the off season. And fuck, man, people love banging heavy weights. They like doing heavy reps. They like testing strength and really playing in different rep ranges, you know, one to three, three to five, five, you know, kind of playing in different things, doing different accessory use of dumbbells. And you know what? As a strength coach, you have to have all of those in your arsenal because you don't know what's coming through your fucking door. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and that was something that, you know, we always preach is, you know, like 
don't be the guy that just has one kick. I mean, because I've met strength coaches. I mean, Todd Rice, who was uh, my guy, was snatch, clean, and jerk. That's all we did, snatch, clean, and jerk. And for me at that point, it was phenomenal. Like, I'd come from a powerlifting background. I'd done bodybuilding. And all of a sudden, I get into a point where I don't back squat anymore, only front squat. Next thing you know, everything flies through the roof. I had other guys that needed to do something completely different. And that program wasn't good for them. I just happened to find the right program at the right time. I mean, I think that's what's so dangerous is people literally, this is what we do. This is all we're going to do. And everybody's going to do it. And you know what? You end up breaking a lot of eggs. And more importantly, it just ends up kind of, you know, getting to that bell curve. And these guys get lost over here. So it's good that you have that different approach that's inspiring. And we, we talked a lot of, about a lot of the bad that's out there. And so, James, you're one of the good. And you're not shy about posting the training that you're putting up. So can you talk to us about your kind of mission with your social media? Cause I know you're all over Twitter and Instagram with the training. Yeah. Um, so I've learned from so many people, so many people. And the only reason I've learned from them is cause they've been willing to share. Right. And there's no secrets. Everyone cleans squats and benches in some capacity. You know what I mean? Um, and so I'm not afraid to share cause I know this. I believe that my job and my role on this team is important to create success for the program, but I ain't the reason I'm a piece of a puzzle. So I don't think that if people from Garner Webb, who's in our conference, see how we're training and start doing some of the stuff we're doing. I don't think that that's going to make us lose to Garner Webb. You know, I'm not afraid of sharing what I do because I'm grateful and appreciative of all the people who have poured into me, whether they know they poured into me or not. So I'm just trying to pay it forward. Also, the kids love seeing themselves on this stuff. <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, I'm trying to create a brand. Great book. I don't know if you've read Brands Win Championships. It's a newer book. It talks about the utilization of social media in the modern world and, and how to maximize your platform to create a brand. You know, I want hashtag owl strength everywhere. You know, I want people to see what we do, and I want them to identify us as a leader in this industry. I want people to use us as a, rec- a reference for what they want their program to look like. Um, and just seeing people pushing prowlers and seeing people doing deadlifts outside and doing jumps, they can copy that stuff, but they don't know how we do it. So yeah, yeah. sharing what we're doing doesn't mean shit, you know, but it's exciting to see and get ideas and stimulate thought. But until you get in here and talk to me and learn how we do it, until you can, you, until you can make it happen with the standard of execution that I believe we, we do very well, then I'm then until you know that I'm not I'm not losing sleep over it, um, and and when you can put it out there, the community can see it. Yeah, your administration can see it. The kids, parents will see it. You know, because people really don't know too much about what goes on behind the state. They know that their kids lift weights. They know that their kids go to study hall. They know that their kids do some of this stuff, but they don't see it. There's no way to see it. So if I'm friends with my defensive end's mother on Instagram or Facebook, mm-hmm. and I post a picture of her kid pushing a prowl, she's like, oh, my God, young Dustin. She shares it. And now 400 new people have seen Owl Strength. Right. And yeah. also, we have some type of a brand to be proud of. And that's good for our school because it's so young, our program because it's so young. And here's the big thing. The more people know Owl Strength, the more people want to hire my GAs. The more people that want to hire my GAs, the better GA I got coming in next. Right. For yeah. example, May of 2014, I advertised on a football scoop, on strength scoop for a graduate. Says I got like 27 applications. I apply, I put one up a couple months ago, and I got 196. Yes. Yeah. Wow. My social media presence and the people I've met through that has certainly expanded the pool of applicants, so I now have more to pick from. Right? And I was able to get – I don't know. My first guy was a rock star. We just promoted him. He's out Sandy Ellis Spratly. He's the man. I got lucky with him. Right. But now I'm getting 200 people to look through instead of 30. Right. Coach, we're, uh, we're actually looking at your Instagram and uh, that weight room is pretty sexy. Oh, she's ba- She's a babe. Man. I know. She's, I, I, so did you get to pick colors and everything for the team? Everything. The yeah. only thing my boss, who's the head football coach wanted, he said, I want to make sure it's got a lot of logos. I'm like, okay, I was going to do it anyway. Um, you know, we had great, great op- opportunities to work with some great companies. I chose Sornex for the yeah, it's versatility and their uh, they, their shit is hands down uh, the best there is. I mean, I, I um, yeah, I like you know the only thing that kind of makes it you know like uh, if you if you ever walk into like a garage gym or a small environment like a personal training place and they got Sornex, you know somebody really's into the shit. 
they got a clue. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, like for uh, a major, you know, legitimate collegiate strength conditioning program, uh, it's hands down the best stuff. I mean, Burton, those guys uh, far and above anything I've ever seen. Like, like, I mean, we walked into a lot of big time weight rooms and if I see the Sornex, it's like, Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, they're fucking wired up. I mean, I, I walked into uh, the guys at Baylor last summer, and I was like, this shit's on point. Let's fucking go. And, like, that type of stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's legit. It looks nice. I mean, they do such nice branding. I mean, the power coat or the powder. I mean, like, just the quality of what they do is so nice. Yeah, and they, and they treat you right, too, and, and they make sure they take care of you, and they their customer service is fantastic. And then Play did our floor. Play is located 10 minutes down, down the road. Yeah, sure. from, oh, yeah, I know that, too. Woodstock, Georgia. So we were able to get a great deal. and I love the sand pit. Um, the, pool, the, the pool floor was a risk, but it, it paid off pretty good. The sand pit we got lucky with. We didn't install it. That's a sand volleyball court for rec sports. But I'm like, I have a sand pit at my disposal with four courts and a ton of space. Let's use it. Dude, the first time I ever saw the sand pit was uh, at Texas A&M. Uh, we, I, I think I was in my like, maybe third or fourth year, and my strength coach, a guy named Rafael Ruiz, um, a bunch of his interns and guys he worked with working on Texas A&M. So we all went down there and uh, trained with those guys. And uh, we literally spent probably 90 minutes in sand pit with those kids. Uh, you know, five, 10, five short shuttle. I mean, we were doing heads up seven up. I mean, you know, uh, to get the, you know, single flag type stuff. Yeah. I mean, the amount of things that you could do in a sand pit, so, so much fun. It's such good competition. And uh, you know, you feel like you're covered in sand. You feel like you've got something done. Mm-hmm. Uh one of the most fun times I've had. So, I mean, and I definitely, it was always fun competing against those kids. Oh, you got Jacob Slider too. Oh, that was fucking Jacob's ladder is, <laughs> you, know, you don't use it for much training. That's more of, oh, you showed up late? How many minutes you, That's what I figured, yeah. Do, uh, do, do you guys use the, uh, uh, the Versa Climbers at all? No, oh, they're too expensive, man, for us. Do I we, would uh, kill to have a Versa Climber, but they're three grand. Do we, well, uh, trip pony. we have three of them. Uh, I trained a kid who was the number two, four pick overall in the major league draft uh, for baseball. And he came to us um, and I, you know, was, you know, kind of stuck in, you know, single A, double A ball uh, came in and all we did was just get him ready and just give him a little bit of football work ethic. Cause as you know, baseball is fucking organized grab ass. And uh, he ends up uh, going in and he ended up hitting the winning hit in the world series this year. Wow. So when he ended up kind of blowing up and doing really well, he ended up, uh, he's like, you know, I want to buy you guys something. I was like, well, I need three of these. And he came back with three Versa climbers. And so that was what he, uh, he gave or, you know, gifted us for, uh, you know, helping him that, that year. So uh, we, we have three of them and we have used those things. They are the most, some of the most dastardly fucking pieces of equipment we have. They're brutal. And I would love to have them. The problem is, is that I grew, so I'm training two groups each day, five days a week, and then 45 kids in each group. Yeah. I mean, you one, one versa climb, I can't use it for shit. No, you yeah. need 10 of them. No, 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 10 of them, yeah. You got 30 grand for me? Uh, no. <laughs> well, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, so, so, no, but that's, that's the big thing. So, like, when I built my weight room, everything was built around efficiency. So I have 15 sure. racks. Every rack has 500 pounds of plates, a barbell, a set of bands, a set of chains, three kettlebells, three medicine balls, power blocks, 127 pounds, DC blocks, uh, 24 inches worth. So whatever we want to do, we can do in a one-stop shop. 60 kids in 60 minutes, no sharing of equipment, no running over each other, no anything. It's all built around efficiency because I knew I was going to train big groups. Um, now, if I, you know, as we evolve, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have good resources available to me. I have a good budget every year, but I need to be smart with that. And I'm not about to spend a ton of money on a product that I can only use with individuals at a time. I owe it to the team to upgrade barbells. I owe it to, to the team to get more weight belts. You know, Spud Inc. is the, the gold standard in my opinion. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, you know, I owe it to the team to buy another round, another set of chains for every rack so we get double chain at every rack. So that's kind of where my, the, the, the money goes now. It always has to go in a way that I'm going to benefit a large portion of the team, if that makes sense. So when I use a Versa Clever ad, I would use the shit out of a Versa <laughs> <laughs> No, they're fucking terrible, dude. I mean, we, uh, it's, it's a one trick pony where, you know, a set of chains can be used for so much. Yeah, we, I mean, we use those. We're, we're big on, uh, like, uh, the assault bikes. and like you we know, got one of those, yeah, which is phenomenal. Yeah, that assault bike is, uh, uh, yeah, another dastly piece of equipment. I mean, it's um, it's pretty cool to see you doing some super unconventional stuff. I actually really like the uh, uh, the roller you guys were doing with the kettlebells against the bands. That's, uh, 
Yeah, it's an account you kind of scroll through. And you're like, God, I want to. I, I'd join this gym or I'd join let's, this program. Let's go lift again. Yeah, let's, yeah, go, let's, let's go bang some more. <laughs> yeah, I would happily go intern. You know, the, uh, uh, I don't know if my wife would dig on it, but I'd be like, <laughs> I don't think she'd go for the the free. Oh. I'll give you a couple t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. That, that, Wait, that's those, all right. Those I, camo ones are pretty bad. I had this really cool job before this that actually paid me pretty well. So, and I did blow all my money on you know Bentley hookers and blow. <laughs> yeah, just sadly, sadly. But you could have had a lot of fun. I, I, but you I could have had more fun if I had, you know, like. But uh, I, yeah. I, I always think, what, what was the movie, The Mummy, when like Brandon Fraser's when J O is, he was like they were getting ready to execute him, and they're like, "What did he do wrong?" He's like, "He had too much fun." Yeah, and they were getting. You remember saw the, movie the, the mummy? mummy? Like that? Not one I've committed to memory. It's, the Scorpion. That is a all, first serious, of all, serious. The fact that like, you have okay, because Luke is the purveyor of the shittiest fucking movies on the planet. What do you mean? Oh my! God. <laughs> the Mummy was the Rock's first movie. I understand yeah. that. The Mummy with Brendan Fraser. So, so they're getting ready to execute him. I understand. Right? I and, they, and they walk by, they're like, "What about him?" They're like, "He had too much fun." As they take him over there to chop his head off. Uh-huh. I always felt that that was in the NFL. They're going to execute you for having too much fun. Oh yeah. But, well, James is jumping on and watching all these videos. That's motivation for you to continue to coach and coach well because you're yeah, well, I, I want, I, what I try to do is I try to put different people out there all the time because we've all seen coaches who put videos of the same good kids all yeah. the time and I try to make sure I diversify it for the kids too but to make sure that you know everybody you know you can see that my standard is one across the board and there's uniformity and everything and uh um, and I don't try to wow people. I don't, I'm not trying to go out here saying I do a better job than anybody else because I don't claim to do a better job than anybody else. But if I could put something out there that can stimulate some thought, if I could put something that's going to, you know, make our program a little bit more well-known, then I'm going to do that. And I have fun doing it. The kids have fun doing it. Um, we do a lot of little things, competitions with superhero groups and rap artists. And we do a lot of stuff to try to make the environment more dynamic, exciting, and diverse. Yeah. Um, that's a conversation for another day. We don't want to go down that road. <laughs> Uh, but if you scroll down, like you'll see a lot of the different ways that we use social media and the way I have four TVs in my room and how we do studs and duds after every run, we, we, eva- we evaluate who, who are the best guys, who are the worst guys. We put it up on the screen, make sure everyone knows and yeah. utilize it in different ways to make sure. So transparency is key. We do not fear transparency here. Yeah. And, and for, well, real quick, if anybody's like listening and they're not going to read this blog post, the account is KSU underscore FB underscore uh, strength forward. So and then my name, my name, Jim Carizzi on Facebook. I know Facebook's dead with a lot of people, but I put just as much, if not more on Facebook. It's just not under Kennesaw Strange Day. It's Jim Carizzi. So coach, I wish you had an easier out. handle. We got to get you I know, I've your said. handle. Uh, it's all, all, so much typing. You're so Man, much underscore. You're such a diva these days. The gym's too hot. I have to type too much. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. <laughs> well, I mean, you know what? You hurt my feelings. I only have to be John, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're you're a bright, shining flower, and I think you're a wonderful human being, and I, uh, I like being we, around you. We are not kind and gentle in our office. Uh, part of our, uh, yeah, in, in our job description is uh, if you are kind and gentle or you sensitive, you probably get fired really fast, yeah. or you have to move away and work for us remotely. It's a long, thankless road <laughs> full of criticism is what it is. And we wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> it's like the Simpsons where, you know, there's the stone of uh, shame and the stone of celebration, like when he's in the stone cutters. Ah. But anything else, guys, for, for Coach? No, it's been awesome. I, uh, I'm uh, very, very inspiring, great stuff, and I you know just look forward to, to you know checking you guys out, watching, and more importantly, reading anything that you're putting out, so... Uh, man, I would I would actually love to get you to do a guest blog post for us on Power Athlete. Uh, you know the information you're putting out, would, I will take anything. Yeah, so. I'm willing to share. You just give me a topic, I'll write it up. I got no problem doing. I like helping put it back again. I've been so fortunate to be taught by so many great people that it's my responsibility to pay it forward. And I got no secrets. Um, so any questions, anytime you guys want me to contribute, I, I would I'd be honored to. Awesome. And if if people want to just uh, peek out more besides the social media, how could they reach you if you want to take inquiries? Like what what else should people check out? If you want to email me, um, jcaritzi at kennesaw.edu. My last name, jcaritzi at kennesaw.edu. You can put that in like the, however you want to do it. Um, Again, Jim Caritzi on Facebook, hit me up, private message me, hit me up on my wall. Um, Again, the Instagram, Twitter is KSUFP strength, same thing. Um, I'm not, I, I'll do my very best to get back to every single person that reaches out because they're always sucked when you reach out to somebody and they don't respond. I'm not going to tell you I'm 100%. I'm not. Right. There's a lot going on. But 
I would love to do whatever I can to help anybody out there because, again, I got to pay it forward. I owe it. I owe it to the field that's done so much for me that I value so much that uh, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll pay it forward however I can. And not that you need necessarily – or maybe you want a, a, a deeper pool, but what if somebody wants to try an intern? Where do they go to check that out? Shoot me an email. And, right. uh, strengthscoop.com. I don't know how many – it's on Football Scoop, but Strength Scoop. That has all the current postings for internships, jobs, graduate assistant positions. Um, if, you, if you're interested in getting in the game, you've got to get out there and, and look for stuff. Sure. Um, so Strength Scoop, we, we, everybody posts there and you just follow directions. Yeah, the trick is to get ahead of those posts and just reach out and throw your name into the pool before they're even looking. That is the smartest thing to do. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Coach, it was a great show. I mean, it's yes. awesome, awesome uh, experience. And thanks so much for taking the time because you are a busy man. I always love it when we don't have to talk much. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of talking. Uh, you, you know what? And I was going to say, you're not a talker, but you totally proved this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Coach. Yeah, right, have a good one. Thanks yes, a lot. Now it's time for you to empower your performance. You heard the man, hit him up on social media under his name, Jim Carizzi, or follow the team on Instagram at KSU underscore FB underscore strength. No doubt you'll be inspired by what you see from these young athletes. Until next time, bye!